Peru ousted President Pedro Castillo, requested a meeting with the delegation of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. The president-elect of Brazil, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, announced the ministers of his new government. And the Russia's defense ministry reported on Thursday that Moscow and Beijing armored vessels began joint naval exercises in the East China Sea. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is From the South. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada. And now we begin with the news. The ousted president of Peru, Pedro Castillo, who is in preventive detention for 80 months, requested on Wednesday that the delegation of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights visit him urgently. The former president, who is facing a judicial process for the alleged crime of rebellion, said in a message posted on his Twitter account that he is arbitrarily deprived of his rights. Castillo also said for a meeting and asked for a meeting, noting that despite the commitment of the commission, no contact with him have been established. His lawyer, Wilfredo Robles Rivera, demanded the commission to avoid politicization in favor of the interests of the de facto government headed by the designated president Dina Boluarte. In Peru, the Quichua tribes claims as theirs the lands where the Cordillera Azul National Park is located, in a stretch of the Peruvian Amazon rainforest. These lands are now in the hands of the non-profit CIMA. When the park was established, Kishwa tribe members lost unfair access to their ancestral land, while Sima managed the park and sold forced carbon credits worth many million dollars. An international labor organization convention signed by Peru says lands traditionally used to sustain indigenous peoples belong to them. An investigation found evidence that the villages existed in the recurrent locations outside what is now the park. Kishwa leaders have gone to court to find out the amount of money raised by the carbon credits program and have demanded compensation or land restitution. And the president-elect of Brazil, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, announced on Thursday most of the names of the minister of his new government. The leader of the Workers' Party, PT, announced that the president of Fiocruz and professor at the University Research Institute of Rio de Janeiro, Nisia Trinade Lima, will become Minister of Health. In turn, the Minister of Education will be headed by the former governor of Ceará, Camilo Santana. At the same time, the economist professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and PhD in Economics of Industry and Technology, Esther Dweck, will help the, minister, the new Ministry of Management. In turn, the former governor of Sao Paulo, the mayor of Sao Vicente, federal deputy and president of the Joao Mangabiera Foundation, Marcio Franza, will head the Ministry of Ports and Airports as of 2023. Likewise, the Ministry of Science and Technology will be headed by the vice governor of Pernambuco, president of the Communist Party of Brazil and former federal deputy Luciana Santos. On December the 9th, Lula announced the first five names of ministers from his coming administration, which will take office on January 1st. These were the former mayor of Sao Paulo, Fernando Haddad, for the Treasury, the governor of Bahia, Rui Costa, for the Civil House, Jose Mucio Monteiro, for the defense senator-elect Flavio Dino for justice and Ambassador Mauro Vieira as the new chancellor. On Wednesday, the president of Chile, Gabriel Boric, announced Chile will open an embassy in Palestine during a Christmas celebration with the Palestinian community in the country. 
Boris's announcement came amidst the backdrop, the backdrop of a crisis in relations with Israel. In September, the Chilean president canceled the meeting for the delivery of credentials to the Israeli ambassador in Chile, Gli Arstel, after the murder of a Palestinian teenager at the hands of the Israeli troops. In this line, Boris said that one cannot forget a community that is suffering an illegal occupation and expressed the will of the Chilean state to increase its diplomatic representation in Palestine. We are going to raise the character of our official representation in Palestine, of charge the affairs. We are going to open an embassy of our government to give it the corresponding representation, to demand in all spaces something so basic, so simple, what is not being done today, which is that international law be respected, nothing more and nothing less. In El Salvador, family members and human rights organizations ask Nayib Bukele's government for Christmas without political prisoners. With candles and pastors, relatives of detainees during the emergency regime and political prisoners gathered on Wednesday night in San Salvador and asked for the release of their family members. At the same time, they affirmed that after months of detention, many have no news of their families, so they ask the government to allow them to visit them. A report by human rights organizations stated that during the emergency regime enforced since the end of March, there have been multiple violations, more than 90 thats in custody of state security forces and cases of torture and ill treatment. And the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Dominican Republic, Roberto Alvarez, called on Wednesday before the United Nations Security Council for a foreign military intervention as a solution to the crisis in Haiti. Alvarez affirmed that the international community must act immediately while emphasizing that the deployment of a multinational military force in Haiti is the only viable path. At the same time, the high diplomat pointed out that his country has facilitated access to fuel to maintain some basic operations in Haiti following the government's request while specifying that between October and December, the purchase of hundreds of gallons of diesel, gasoline and fuel oil were eased. Haiti has seen an acute economic and social crisis that has deepened since July 2021 with the assassination of Prime Minister Jovenel Moïse. Recently, popular protests and demands have rejected the requests for a foreign intervention by local authorities. And the scandals continue in Uruguay following the arrest of Alejandro Astesiano, the former head of security of Uruguayan President Luis Lagaipu. Astesiano was arrested on September 26 after a civil registry official warned about illegal activities by two Russian citizens who were applying for their ID cards. The former security chief is under investigation for several crimes, such as having contacts that allow him to process the required documentation to acquire the passports and sell them to the Russians. Let's take a short break, but first, remember you can follow us on our TikTok account at Telesur English, in which you will be able to see news in different formats, news updates, and more. Other stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back. Russia's defense ministry reported on Thursday that Moscow and Beijing armored vessels began joint naval exercises in the East China Sea. According to the report, both sides practiced tactical maneuvering and conducted a communications exercise. The ministry said earlier that the Varyag missile cruiser, the Marshall Shapronishkov destroyer, and the two corvettes of Russia's Pacific Fleet took part in the maneuvers. It also said that the Chinese Navy deployed the destroyers Jinan and Bao Tu, as well as frigates Binzhu and Yanshan, a supply ship and a submarine. The joint C-2022 Russia-China naval drills will last until December 27th.
And the Central Bank of Russia informed today that the use of mere payment system cards is accepted in 10 countries in the world, and its implementation is being assessed in 11 others. According to the financial entity, MIR cards are currently accepted in Armenia, Vietnam, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Belarus, South Ossetia, Albakskia, and South Korea. The central bank specified that in all these nations the use is not equal. Some of them work only in automatic cashiers and others in banks connected to the national payment system. Finally, the Central Bank of Russia informed that in the 11 nations interested in connecting to the Russian payment system at the moment are Iran, Indonesia, Cuba, Myanmar, Egypt, Thailand, India, Venezuela, Mauritius, Nigeria, and Ethiopia. Croatia prepares to begin the new year fully integrating with the world's richest nations in an historic achievement three decades after the country's split from former Yugoslavia. On January the 1st, the small Balkan nation of about 4 million people, known for its stunning Adriatic Sea coastline and resort islands, will join the free movement Schengen Zone where most European Union citizens are not subject to passport checks. It will also become the 20th country to replace its national currency, the Kuna, with the common European one. To adopt the euro, Croatia has had to fulfill a set of strict economic conditions since joining the European Union in 2013, including having a stable exchange rate, low inflation and sound public spending. During his 10-hour visit to the U.S. on Wednesday, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky told the Congress that he proposed a peace formula in his meeting with President Joe Biden, which he hoped will result in joint security guarantees for decades to come. Meanwhile, the Ukrainian president stressed that Washington's assistance is crucial to support the armed conflict and stated that Ukrainian soldiers can perfectly handle American tanks and planes. This was Zelensky's first visit abroad since the beginning of the conflict with Russia in February. It also coincided with the negotiations to move forward with a new budget for fiscal year 2023 that includes $45 billion in emergency funds to finance the Ukrainian armed forces. Now we move on to other topics. India's health ministry said on Thursday it began randomly testing international passengers arriving at its airports for COVID-19, citing an increase in cases in neighboring China. Health minister Majuk Mandavia announced the new rule in parliament where he also urged the state governments to increase surveillance for any new coronavirus variants and to send samples of all positive cases to genome sequencing laboratories. Mandavia also asked the public to wear masks and maintain social distancing even though there are no official mandates for either. India relaxed its mask wearing measures earlier this year after coronavirus cases began dropping sharply. This Wednesday, the World Health Organization Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus said in a briefing that the UN needs more information about the cases on COVID-19 severity in China, particularly regarding hospital and intensive care unit admissions to make a comprehensive risk assessment of the situation. The is very concerned over the evolving situation in China with increasing reports of severe disease. In order to make a comprehensive risk assessment of the situation on the ground, WHO needs more detailed information on disease severity, hospital admissions, and requirements for ICU support. WHO is supporting China to focus its efforts on vaccinating people at the highest risk across the country. And we have more news coming up after a final short break, so stay with us.
Welcome back. During her visit to Beijing, Australia's Foreign Minister Penny Wong said her government wants to normalize relations with China. Her statement came amid the first visit by an Australian official to the Asian giant in four years. The government's made clear that we believe it's in Australia's interest for our relationship with China to be stabilised. We've also made clear we believe it is in China's interest for the relationship to be stabilised. Uh, we have continued to express the view that the comprehensive strategic partnership between Australia and China uh, is architecture for dialogue and for engagement uh, which uh, will benefit both countries. We have content continued to uh, put the view uh, that we are able to grow our bilateral relationship and uphold our respective national interests if we navigate our differences wisely. And that is the challenge for this generation, is to navigate those differences wisely. Now we move on to other topics. In Malaysia, the death toll rose to 30 after a landslide in the city of Bhutan Kali in the state of Selangor. According to the authorities, seven other people are still missing. Officials said that 680 search personnel, police and firefighters are continuing to work on the situation. The causes of the incident, which occurred at an organic farm near the capital Kuala Lumpur, are so far unknown. Aside of the 30 killed, there are 61 survivors out of 94 people involved. The incident occurred at a time when the country is in the middle of the monsoon season, which has already forced the displacement of more than 70,000 people. On Thursday, a women's protest in Kabul was repressed by the uh, Taliban in Afghanistan. Shouting all or none and we want equal education opportunities, dozens of women, mostly students and social activists, were protesting in the Debori area against the government's decision to ban female education in universities. However, the security forces violently dispersed the protest and arrested several of the demonstrators. In addition to this measure, since taking power, the Taliban imposed a veto against secondary education for women and imposed the veil and gender segregation in public places. The governments of Iran and Russia agreed to build a river communications network from Eastern Europe to the Indian Ocean to promote international trade in the face of Western sanctions. Both countries are spending billions of dollars to speed up cargo delivery along rivers and railways linked to the Caspian Sea. Ship tracking data compiled by Bloomberg shows dozens of Russian and Iranian ships, including some subjected to sanctions, already ply the route. It is an example of how competition between great powers is rapidly reshaping trade networks in a global economy that seems set to fragment into rival blocs. Russia and Iran, under tremendous pressure from sanctions, are turning towards each other and they both are also looking eastward. They aim to protect trade links from Western interference and to build new ones with the giant and fast-growing economies of Asia. And this Thursday, Israeli military forces killed 23-year-old football player Ahmad Atef Mustafa Darakma during a military raid in the northern West Bank city of Nablus. The young man played for Takafi, a football team from the town of Tulkarem. Confrontations erupted when numerous Israeli military and police swept into the area to protect settlers who had broken into the patriarch Joseph Stump. In the operation, they also wounded at least other 24 Palestinians. Palestine Prime Minister Mohammed Stayeh has called on the International Federation of Association Football FIFA to condemn the killing perpetrated by occupation forces. The number of Palestinians killed by the Israeli army in the occupied territories since January this year has reached a total of 224. And we have come to the end of this news break. But remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. 
For Telesuri English, I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.